Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to wait just a few moments for more people to join us, and then we'll get started with today's webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our webinar today. My name is Carol David. I'm the Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and our Grow Native program. And our program today is Missouri Mushrooms and their association with native plants. Very pleased that our presenter, Melissa Brigler, could join us today and give this presentation. Melissa Brigler began working for the Missouri Department of Conservation in 2007 as a grasslands botanist. In that position, she conducted research projects associated with prairie management and reconstruction. Melissa became the state botanist in 2009. Her primary responsibilities in this role include guidance and oversight of botanical components of the Missouri National Heritage Program and coordination of Missouri's ginseng program. She also serves as the Missouri Department of Conservation plant expert and coordinates plant collection permits on lands owned or leased by the Department of Conservation. She's also the Executive Secretary of the Mid-Missouri uh, 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 Chapter of the Missouri Mycological Society. And oh, I think, she, oh, she's, she's Executive Secretary and she's the Chapter President and she's been a member since 2011. And with that, uh, welcome Melissa, we look forward to your program. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here to talk with you about mushrooms and how they are, um, you know, in relationship with native plants too. So it's kind of just, you know, both very fun worlds to talk about today. Uh, like Carol did say, I am a botanist for the conservation department. Uh, we don't have a staff mycologist on um, with our department, which a mycologist is one that studies mushrooms. Um, so it just kind of naturally fell into my hands and that has been actually already even I think 11 or 12 years ago I've been um, in this position and I really didn't know much at all about mushrooms when I got here and I've, I've learned a lot since then and I'm sure I still have a lot more to learn but what I'm going to do today is uh, just um, share some of the things that I've learned about mushrooms and it does kind of branch into plants as well because those two things are very um, closely tied sometimes. So we're going to talk about that this afternoon. Almost evening. Let's see here. Let me make sure I can get my slide to advance. It's kind of touchy, so hopefully I don't do it too far. Um, depending on your background knowledge of what mushrooms are, sometimes people are already aware of these things I'm going to go through, and some people it's like a completely new uh, revelation to them. So I'm going to talk first about what a mushroom actually is. Um, because some people do kind of think they're sort of like plants, you know, they have roots and, and they, they grow like plants, but actually it is a fungus, which is very different than a plant. So instead of reproducing by seeds, like many plants do, uh, mushrooms reproduce by spores, or, and I should say the fungus reproduces by spores. So it's, it's truly a fungus. And what we are seeing in that mushroom is what we refer to as a fruiting body. So a mushroom is the fruiting body of a fungus. Um, we don't, a lot of times see the fungus itself, what we see is that fruiting body. And whenever we um, like say pick a mushroom out of the ground, uh, we're not pulling out the fungus per se, we're pulling out that fruiting body. And there's an analogy that I use a lot that kind of helps people understand this is kind of like picking an apple from an apple tree. So whenever we're um, picking out a, picking a mushroom, say pulling a morel off the, out of the ground, it's like we're picking an apple off that tree. We're pulling that mushroom off, we've removed that fruiting body, but the, the actual fungus is still um, left un, unharmed, just like an apple tree is left unharmed when you pick the apple. Um, the actual fungus though, is what we refer to as mycelium. Depending on the species, uh, mycelium a lot of times will look kind of like a cobwebby substance, kind of um, like hair, really thin hair. And it can be growing in several different types of substrate. So it can be growing in um, soil, it can be growing in a rotting log, um, sometimes even in like decaying animals or feces or whatever that, that 
fungus is growing out of. That's the substance the mycelium is, is growing in. So that's where the actual body of the fungus is. And the mushroom, what we're seeing is the fruiting portion of that fungus. Let's see, okay. And so um, if you're wondering if you've ever seen mycelium before, you probably have. So many of us are probably familiar with uh, grabbing a clump of mulch and holding it in our hands and it's kind of held together with all this cobwebby stuff. Uh, and that's called mycelium, that's the mycelium that we're looking at. Um, also, if you've ever taken like the bark off of a rotting log and behind it, there's these cobwebby kind of strands of hair, that's also mycelium. So depending on the species, you know, that's, uh, um, it would look different in different species, but some of those are the more visible ones that we can see. And then also, I think probably with a grow native group, we, we do some plant identification. We know what some plants are, are, you know, how to identify certain plants. And we know that we look at the leaf types and the leaf shape and the margins. And then we look at the stems and what types of flowers it has. Well, mushrooms are the same way. We have lots of different uh, cues to look at and to pay attention to when identifying mushrooms. So I think it's important to just run through a few of the parts of the mushroom that we, we have to kind of identify or, or pay attention to when we're identifying mushrooms. So um, this is a very typical looking mushroom, you know, the cap and stem and everything. There are so many different um, varieties and shapes and types of fruiting bodies of fungus. It's, it's mind boggling. But this is a, a most typical one and it's the easiest one to really explain the parts of a mushroom. Um, first of all, though, we do have a cap. Doesn't always look like the cap that you see here, but we have various cap types. And then the, uh, you know, of course, the caps can be in different colors. They can have scales on the cap. They can be kind of a concave shape or a convex cape shape. Um, so different characteristics about a cap. One of the most important things in looking at mushrooms and trying to identify them is to look on the underside of the cap. I get lots of phone call or lots of uh, pictures come in of a mushroom and all I can see is the top part. And it, 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 um, it leaves out so much information to be able to identify the mushroom. We really, at the very minimum, need to see the underside of that cap. So different types of pore surfaces are underneath that cap or in a part of that cap. And uh, it can be, and this is where the spores are being released. So that's the pore surface. So it can be a gilled pore surface where we have the gills of a mushroom that most of us are familiar with. Uh, we also have a tube pore surface where it's, it's kind of like uh, long skinny tubes where the spores actually come out of these long pores uh, or tubes. And then the, the pore surface is like somebody took a, a little pin and just pricked a whole bunch of little holes in that cap. And that's a poor, poor surface. So, uh, so various different types, and I'll show photos of that. Um, when you look at the stalk, or what some people refer to as the stipe, is kind of the stem of the mushroom. Various different types you can imagine. Some are spindly, some are very thick and fleshy, some have scales on them. Um, some of them actually retain a ring, and that, that ring around that mushroom was, um, is persistent in some species where as that mushroom is developing, the cap expands and in some species it typically just fall, whatever material is left on that stem still stuck to it falls off, but other species it retains that, that ring quite nicely. So that's a, a characteristic to take note of. And then as we work our way down, a lot of the mushrooms do have what we refer to as um, a distinctive button stage or an egg stage. And it literally looks like a little egg that's sitting right at the soil surface. And gradually uh, it will end up producing the mushroom. Um, some mushrooms, again, like with the ring, some mushrooms retain that, vul we call it a vulva. And it's the, the leftover remnant part of that initial egg uh, material. So uh, that's also something to, to really pay attention to. And I have some examples to share of that because I know that it is a little bit, it's more helpful <laughs> to look at examples. So this is an example of the vulva and ring and um, very characteristic of what we, refer, what we uh, have called Ammonida mushrooms. So Ammonida is the genus of this type of fungus and they are well known for being poisonous mushrooms, so very dangerous. 
And um, so beautiful though, it's kind of like um, venomous snakes and things that people still find amazing, but they can be dangerous to you. So yeah, these mushrooms can be dangerous, but only if you eat them. Uh, you can pick them up and look at them, just don't stick them in your mouth and swallow, you'll be fine. Um, but they do have a very characteristic uh, feature there that they retain that ring around the stem. And, and oftentimes they do, not all the time. So if you just think it's an, an ammonita type mushroom, but it doesn't have a ring, well, that it could be because it fell off or, you know, it, it rained hard and the rain knocked it off. But typically uh, you would see that. And then you would also see that bulba um, at the bottom. So you can see that in um, a few of those, that blusher on the upper right picture, you don't see that kind of swollen base to that mushroom. But I'll bet you anything is underneath those leaves, <laughs> probably. Uh, but you do see that persistent ring on the stem of that one. And then you can see that kind of bulbous base on the other two as well. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. Uh, and these are various pore surfaces. So like what I said earlier, you can have uh, various types and it's extremely important to know, you know, you would never know what the pore surface is by looking at the top of the mushroom, the top of the cap. So the meadow mushroom has, is a good example of a gilled pore surface. Um, Boletes have that, that tube pore surface where they've got these long tubes that kind of stretch out. It's kind of like if you would take a whole bunch of paper towel rolls, empty paper towel rolls and hold them together and they'd make a lot of tubes that way. That's kind of what it looks like just in a um, reduced, of course, size and everything in the mushroom. Uh, one thing I didn't mention with the diagram though, we do have a spine type pore surface and that's what uh, you see in the lower left corner with the hedgehog mushroom. And on the underneath, it actually makes spines. Uh, and then the maize polypore is an example of a pore, pore surface where you've just got these little bitty holes all underneath the cap. And there are various types of caps. So all of these are different types of caps. So I showed you the, um, the cap and stem typical mushroom that most people, if you say, draw me a picture of a mushroom, that's what you come up with for probably most people. But all of these are, are caps as well. They're just different variations of it. Um, so dead man's fingers is always a crazy one to find. We have two species of that in the state. One is, is looks like that they're pretty small and the others are, are larger. They're actually about the size of your fingers and it truly does sort of look like you know, fingers reaching up at you from the ground, which come out in the fall, which kind of make it even more neat. <laughs> um, the snow fungus mushroom is that kind of jelly type fungus at the upper right. So various types of calves. The garbled false morel is kind of um, a different looking one too. Uh, devil's urn in the, the lower left corner is shaped kind of like a bowl, like an urn. And these are, you know, um, releasing spores into the atmosphere, just like a, a regular cap and stem mushroom does, just in a different, different way. And one thing too that comes in to play quite a bit in identifying mushrooms is to look at what the spore color is. Uh, and that's an easy way and it's a fun way to determine. You simply do a spore print and it's, um, it, it's, it's really kind of cool to do. And sometimes it can even be artistic. People have made like t-shirts and stuff out of it somehow, but um, some mushrooms are easier to do a spore print than others. But the point is what you're trying to do with this is identify what color of, pore, of what, what is the spore color. So with uh, field guides and things that will give you that, it'll say, well, this is the, this, this a characteristic of this mushroom is it has lilac color spores. So you would want to do a spore cut print and see if it's a lilac color. Um, and, and so that's what they did here. And all you really do is put the cap on a piece of paper. Uh, so what's really handy to do is if you do a light piece, a light colored paper and a dark colored paper, and you can overlap the cap where half of the cap is over light color and the other half is over dark color. And that way, if you have a light colored spore, it will show up better on dark paper. And then if you have a dark color spore, it will show up better on white paper. So then you kind of are able to see um, either way. And it doesn't take long. It only takes, depending on the moisture conditions of the mushroom, it takes um, maybe six to eight hours to really kind of do that. And, and even 12 hours, you could probably have to wait. Um, and some, some mushrooms produce a better spore print than others too, obviously. These are inky caps. And then the upper right, 
Uh, I'm not sure what is in the lower left, but it made a nice forefront. <laughs> And then uh, some other important features when you're looking at mushroom identification, uh, habitat is very important. So if it is found in, um, you know, we think about habitat as being like on a prairie or in the woods or anything like that, but also what, what structure, what substrate it is growing on. So is it growing on wood? Is it growing on um, in the soil? Uh, are the two main kind of breaks. Some, some do both, but most of the time we see that is a, a good distinction to really make sure um, if, if we think it's one mushroom, but it's only found growing on wood and this was found growing on the ground, then we want to do some further investigation. It can get tricky because tree roots can grow just underneath the surface. And I've had that oyster mushrooms, for example, only grow on wood and I've found them growing in the yard before. And I thought, well, this can't be because it's not growing on wood, but it turns out there was a nearby elm tree that was dying and it had some uh, roots just, just right below the surface. And so it appeared to be growing out of the grass, but it really wasn't. Um, also the habit. So some mushrooms grow real tightly together, kind of like the, the mica caps that are like right on top of each other. They look like they're growing on top of each other. Other mushrooms would never grow like that. They grow very single and scattered about. So if you see something like that, but you think it's a mushroom that never would grow something like that, then, then you don't have that same one. So you really got to look at the habit. Some mushrooms are fun with bruising or staining, and it really helps with identification too. And that's something you can't do on, on a picture. Um, you can't, you know, gosh, if you just scrape your fingernail on that, does it turn black? You know, you can't really do that, but you can, um, of course, out in the field. And so the two color bully does that really nicely, makes a, a nice illustration there where somebody had just um, kind of brushed their finger up against the mushroom. And sometimes it takes a little while and sometimes it's immediate and sometimes it would take a, a few hours to really show the bruise. Um, and then season, of course, you know, if, if, it's, um, if it's a spring mushroom or fall mushroom, we have a few that you can find almost, you know, throughout uh, depending on weather conditions. But a lot of our mushrooms are um, specific to a, a particular season. And so I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit. That's just, uh, you know, some mushroom identification, and we'll go through some edible things later. But for now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship that we have between fungus and plants. So um, I talked about the mycelium, and that's the, the actual, you know, body of the fungus. The, the fungus produces that fruiting body, which is the mushroom, but the rest of it is all mycelium. And it's growing within the soil or, the, or whatever substrate it's growing on. That mycelium some mycelium, not all of the mycelium, but some, some species of mushrooms, their mycelium actually interacts with plant roots and they can form a symbiotic relationship where, as is kind of described in that illustration with the tree, um, the mushroom is absorbing water and nutrients that are able to transfer that to the roots of the plant. And then in return, the plant is taking those uh, nutrients and water and photosynthesizing and creating carbohydrates or food and transferring that back to the mushroom. So the mushroom is not hurting the plant and the plant is not hurting the mushroom. In fact, they're helping each other. Um, it's not always that case, of course, because some mushrooms can actually kill a plant. <laughs> so uh, this is just the symbiotic relationship that we're talking about. And we refer to that as mycorrhizal fungi. So those, that's the good fungus uh, that, that we, we like to see. And it, and it really helps the plant. Um, I mean, it helps both of them, but we kind of see it more, you know, we pay more attention typically sometimes to the, the impacts of the plant because we can see that, <laughs> you know, we don't see the, the underground growth of the mycorrhizal. But uh, this picture shows an illustration. We always see um, pine trees as an example. And I do believe this is a pine seedling uh, because they do so much better with the, the presence of mycorrhizal fungi and it makes a nice picture too. But um, the root you can see is kind of the darker portion of that and then all those kind of hair-like extensions is the mycorrhizae. Um, so this, you can see how, you know, it really expands the ability of the seedling to absorb the uh, water and nutrients that would be available. It's much more availability than if that was just the roots. Um, it does it also improve with drought and uh, disease stress because it's, it's maintaining more of a healthy stature because it's getting more 
nutrients. And then of course, with drought stress, um, the more it can have more ability or more availability of water, uh, that would help that too. So yeah, it, it is really neat to, to see, um, you know, if you go online and Google it, uh, you can see like, you know, a, a seedling with no mycorrhizal fungi and a seedling with mycorrhizal fungi. And it's, it's, it's pretty neat. And that in addition, fungi are also breaking down organic material. So even if we don't see that mycorrhizal association, um, the whatever fungus is breaking down this log, you know, in, on the inside now, it's starting to turn into this rich uh, organic matter that is becoming more available to the plants and no longer tied up in a log. So um, even without the mycorrhizal association, uh, fungus can be very beneficial to other plants. The fungus could have possibly killed this tree, <laughs> but in the end, it, it did uh, release those nutrients back for other plants. So it's all connected. Uh, and then just a, a quick illustration to show how large these organisms, the fungus itself can become. Um, the largest organism on the planet has been identified as a fungus and it's an armillaria fungus, which is we refer to as a honey mushroom. Uh, very common and more so in the fall. So we'll start seeing these more and more in the fall. Um, not a symbiotic relationship, it's actually saprophytic. So that fungus is growing, is feeding off of that tree. Um, but uh, it very large organism underground. And so they did these studies in Oregon where they did genetic and DNA analysis to determine how far uh, expanded this mycelium has gotten and they they mapped it to uh, three and a half square miles is one organism. So of course there's probably larger even out there. This is just what they've studied and what we found but um, but yeah it kind of made it made news as the largest largest organism on the planet was a fungus. And so, so a little bit more though with this fungal association and the mycorrhizal fungi, um, this is noted most commonly in orchids. Uh, orchids are uh, very specific. So specific species of orchids and specific species of mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and they've, you know, there's just been a lot more work done with that. And um, that's kind of, that's why orchids are so difficult to uh, established in natural settings. Uh, the horticulture industry has figured out, obviously, by going to Hy-Vee or Gerbs or something, you can see a whole bunch of orchids for sale and everything, and they figured out how this works. But as far as the natural community level, it's, it's difficult to, to orchid conservation is really hard. And part of it is because of the fungal association and the requirement to have that mycorrhizal fungi present with the orchid in order for seeds to germinate. So this is a photo that shows kind of the process. Um, it starts with A, where it's just the plain orchid seeds. Orchid seeds are like dust, it's crazy. Teeny, teeny, tiny little seeds. Um, and this is in like a medium, like a Petri dish where the mycorrhizal fungi can grow. And um, you kind of, you see it expanding and everything. By C, the picture C, you can see there's little mycorrhizal fungi starting to grow off of that seed. Um, and, and expanding then the ability of that seed to gather nutrients for it to germinate. Um, and not just any mycorrhizal fungi will do. It has to be a certain specific species specific to that orchid. So by D and E, you can see it's starting to actually uh, interact with that seed and everything. And then you can see by the time we go through, we actually have a little orchid seedling. So to kind of bring that home to a real life example, um, some of you might be familiar with rattlesnake plantain. We call it plantain, but it's really an orchid, <laughs> go figure. Uh, and it's, it's not um, uh, dirt common in the state, but it is um, scattered uh, throughout the state and it is a neat thing to see when you come across it. Uh, but yeah, it has that same requirement as many orchids do to have the presence of the mycorrhizal fungi. And this is just a, a kind of blown up photo of something that they did the same way in a Petri dish. They had a medium and they were able to grow the fungi with the seed. And so all those little hair-like extensions is that fungi that's uh, providing needed uh, nutrients to the seed. 
So what some of you or many of you are probably asking is like, well, what fungus species are important to native plants? Because we want to make sure we have all of those. So we've got we've got what we need. Um, and for the most part, you know, we're still learning so much about it. What we talk a lot about is macro fungi because we can see that with our eyes, you know, and 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 we see the mushrooms. When we talk about mushrooms, identifying mushrooms, we're talking about macro fungi. There's a host of um, whole another world of micro fungi, and we don't ever even really see what the the fruiting bodies are and everything. It's just so small and and it's um, very detailed. So it's it's a very young field of study, um, and and it is getting a lot of attention though. So I don't mean to imply that not many people are studying it. There are a lot of people studying it. It's just that. You know, only for the past 20 years or so, there have been a lot of people studying it. So there's still a lot to learn. Um, and one of the, the big uh, approaches with it, because it is such a complicated project, I mean, you've got, look at all the plant species you'd be looking at, first of all, and then trying to identify the fungus species and which ones are benefit and which ones are just there. And it's, it's so big of a question. So what uh, researchers have kind of started to chip away at is um, in understanding this issue is let's take some soil from a remnant, you know, high area, a small amount, but inoculate that soil into a, um, a reconstruction or a restoration and then compare that to the reconstruction or restoration that we did not inoculate in. So um, we can try to identify, and I say we, scientists do, I'm, I'm just a field botanist that kind of helps, or helps, helps explain, but researchers are, um, they are, uh, they can identify some to species or some to like kind of a group of fungal species, but what, what we're really looking at is the, is, does it matter? Is it making a difference more than what specific type of fungus? Um, and it's very likely that they don't necessarily require on a specific type too. So orchids are kind of an exception there. Um, but uh, a lot of plants is, is kind of like many, many different species will do. It's not quite that detailed. So the important thing really is to encourage fungal growth. Um, tilling and herbicide kills fungal growth. <laughs> so when you till the, the land and you say plant soybeans, um, you're, you're not doing any favors for the, the mycorrhizal fungi that, that are already there. Um, and you're probably reducing it quite a bit. So what we really need to do is try to just um, not hurt what is already there, first of all. Um, so no-till drilling is, is of course, um, kind of a no-brainer to be able to do. And then inoculating soil. And there's, a, there's, again, there's a lot of research going on with that of the value of doing that. And, you know, what's interesting to point out, especially to this group, you know, we, we always talk as prairie, prairie managers, once a prairie is tilled, it's done. You'll never get that native prairie back again, that remnant prairie. Now, decades later, after being cropped forever, you know, there might be a conservation organization comes along and, and purchases the property and says, we're going to replant the prairie and do amazing work and have amazing success. But you're never going to quite get there again um, as a remnant prairie. And that, it, that might be one of the missing pieces to the puzzle. Um, so inoculating the prairies with um, the soil that comes from remnant prairies, again, not a lot because we don't want to have negative impacts on at all on remnant prairies, but um, having that somehow be incorporated is, is maybe just part of the reason why we can't quite get over that hump in, in restoring a um, prairie to its remnant status. Uh, and then when looking at the plants that are, are the, the uh, mushrooms are beneficial to plants and ones that we can actually see. They're a little more interesting. Uh, I always look more at, at what the what comes up in your gardens and things and, and um, flower beds. Um, it's generally pretty healthy soil, uh, usually a lot of organic material and and also gardening um, websites and things that and it's it's anecdotal. It's not uh, scientifically proven or anything. But um, stink horns um, seem to come up quite a bit in these little upper right corner are bird's nest fungi. You can kind of obvious where it gets that name. 
And then those fun little puff balls in the middle uh, bottom row there. One time when I first started uh, here at State Botanist, somebody sent me a picture of one of those and I had no clue. I was a rotten egg or what I have no idea what that thing is but it turns out it's a it's a type of puff ball it's the only puff ball we, we've got we don't want to eat that one but uh, other puff balls are edible and one of the most disgusting ones is that that one in the lower left corner that one's referred to as dog vomit slime mold which it does definitely look like a dog got sick in your garden uh, and people are just uh, horrified like oh my gosh what do I do what have I done wrong how can I get rid of this but actually uh, I, I, according to gardeners and and people that kind of work in the landscaping industry this is actually a kind of a good sign that shows that you have a healthy soil community uh, if you don't like seeing that, you can just scrape it off. And again, it's just like harvesting apples from a tree. You're not doing any harm to it, but uh, it's not the, the indication of a, you know, a problem like you think it would be. Um, and then, so I do some, I, I do some research to see what, what actual scientific studies have been done to have a benefit to this mycorrhizal fungi. What, what really is, you know, the species of mycorrhizal fungi? And I don't come up with very like cool, flashy, um, showy things to tell you. Uh, a lot of it's like this crust fungi. And it's, you know, like you'll see it on like um, um, trunks of trees and things like that. Uh, so, you know, healthy trees, but yeah, just things that look kind of um, just law uh, but yeah that that is and that is the fruiting body of the fungus so the fungus is growing in there and you're seeing what the fruiting body is and releasing those spores so these are the cerobastidium group and that's what a lot of the research will just key it out to so we don't have an actual species that we're used to seeing like with plants um, I do get questions on this one quite a bit so this is like it just kind of looks like um you know, like shaving cream in your yard. And uh, Sebacina is this one. And I think I got a few more pictures. This is what it looks like. And this has been shown to be um, beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. So when you see this, you know, you've actually, this fungus is helping that plant and that plant is helping that fungus. And it's actually a good sign to see something like that. And then I think I have another, yeah, and this is another Tucinella uh, kind of crust fungi that has been determined as a beneficial fungus for native plants. But again, not really too flashy or um, exciting to look at. It's a pretty color. Uh, but I thought it'd be worth sharing some. Now, the rustulas, though, and we find the rustulas more in, in um, wooded areas and shady areas. Um, and those are, uh, have been shown to be beneficial in a mycorrhizal, in a, um, uh, yeah, mycorrhizal way, you know, so it's, it's, it's benefiting from the plant and the plant is benefiting from it. And rustulas are really neat uh, mushrooms, typical cap and stem, and they have a very defined uh, gill surface. Uh, the red one's pretty cool, uh, but they don't all have that red color. Some of them kind of have a green color, of course, some of them have a white color. So, um, and then as far as the prairie arbuscular mycorrhizae, I, a lot of it is just in the soil. We don't see a lot of mushrooms, you know, typical mushrooms of what we're seeing. Now that fungus is producing spores in some way, but um, a lot of this fungus produces actually very little by spores. It does more just by growing off of the plants that it's interacting with, and that's the best way for it to to reproduce and to grow. So, um, so in prairies, I don't have a whole lot to share for that, but you'll see these uh, mushrooms in the woods quite a bit. And then, uh, you know, but as far as encouraging mycorrhizal growth, there are a lot of products on the market. I, you know, the, the research is so young and all, I'm not sure like encouraging people to, to do it. It's, it's on the market. It's there. I encourage everyone to do their own uh, research. I, I've, I've never heard anything bad, like, oh my goodness, you're introducing exotic mycorrhizal. What are you doing? Uh, certainly looking at where that mycorrhizal came from is probably going to be very important, but encouraging the growth of mycorrhizal. Now I kind of put this in for a gardening club one time. So if we're doing native planting, um, where we're not doing, we're not adding mulch, we're not um, doing compost, we're not doing cover crops or anything like that. Um, 
I think probably just um, kind of letting nature take its course, really. And if you feel like you have a, a lack of the mycorrhizal, and don't, and don't do anything that would um, uh, discourage mycorrhizal growth, like tilling, if you if you can help it, you know, and um, and just trying to encourage the growth of that without adding too much. But I, you know, it's probably worth mentioning that there's products on the market that you can inoculate soil with. I. I, I don't see it happening any outside of, um, or it shouldn't happen outside of native like um, landscape plantings. So that's that. And of course, tilling and herbicide. I know it's kind of hard sometimes to um, make things happen, especially when it comes to controlling invasive species and things like that without some of these methods, but to try to try to avoid it as much as possible. Okay, so then mushroom hunting. I'm gonna go through some edibles too, because I know lots of people end up just wanting to hear about which ones we can eat. Um, just real quickly about mushroom hunting though, it is a very fun, easy thing to do out in the woods. You know, it's, it's difficult to walk through the woods in a bad mood. <laughs> if you're in a bad mood, just go for a walk in the woods. You'll, you'll feel better, I promise. It's, it's therapeutic. Um, good for all age groups as shown in this photo and a, a cheap outdoor thing. You don't need to go out and get an expensive rod and reel or, or a permit or anything like that, depending on where you're going, of course. But, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, most times I don't think you need a permit to go much. And because it is fall, we're gonna talk mainly about fall mushrooms, but I'll be happy to answer questions about any others. So right now, Chicken of the Woods is starting. I haven't seen any yet. I haven't heard of anybody seeing any yet, but it is September, so it's gonna be out there. And it's a nice um, kind of hunter orange color, so you can pick it out like from a distance. It's always growing on wood, and it's got that shelf kind of look. I don't know anything else that looks like that. So it's kind of nice to have an edible that doesn't have a close look alike. Uh, here's some more pictures. These can get pretty big, um, ranging from you know, small two inches to like 12 inches wide. Again, always found on wood. It can sometimes be found in the springtime. Uh, it just given the, the right conditions, but then of course it takes a break in the summer and then we see it again about this time of year. This one's a little bit more difficult to pick out. It's called hen of the woods. So we have chicken of the woods and hen of the woods. Um, so it can get kind of confusing sometimes, but uh, it looks like a ruffled up hen. It's always growing at the base of a tree. So it's it's on wood, but it wouldn't be up high. It'd be down at the base of the tree. And it has these spoon-shaped caps. So there's other look-alikes out there, but they they are edible, um, but they're some of them won't taste as good. Um, but these have kind of these spoon-shaped caps. Some of the others are their look-alike. I'm not going to have time to talk about all of them are edible too, and, and they probably taste well, but these hen of the wood seems to taste better, I guess, for everybody. Uh, again, it's a fall mushroom. You have to be almost on top of it to be able to see it because it kind of just blends in well with the, the forest floor. Uh, I talked a little bit about puffballs earlier, and we have a couple different, well, I have a lot of different species of puffballs. We have a few different species of uh, within the genus that we both, re we refer to them both as puffballs, even though they're in different genera. So Lycoperidon and Calvadia are the two genera of puffballs that we have. Um, and that we refer to anyway as puffballs. So what you wanna do is, well, and first of all, let me explain that there are quite the variety in size with these species. So we have some puffballs that are very big. They can even be as big as like a soccer ball. Um, and, and then we have some that are just the size of, you know, the circumference of a, um, you know, like a, a one inch circumference or so. They're, they're just really teeny tiny. Uh, and they are always growing on soil or decaying wood. So usually on the ground, I will say, but if it's decaying wood, it's just really decayed wood. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, here's a few other species of puffballs. And so these are the Lycoperidon species uh, and they do not get very big. They don't get the size of, of soccer balls or anything. Um, and they are more of a later season. So about now we would see them until the end of the fall. Uh, what we wanna do with puffballs though is to make sure that we cut it down the middle and that the entire middle is white, like is shown there. So that's another one of those giant puffballs. Um, too bad it's found in like next to a big old tire. It always bothers me to see, <laughs> but she found a puffball in a place where they dump trash. 
So if it is as white as a piece of bread in the middle, then it, it will be good to eat. But if it's starting to turn kind of a tan color, um, that means that mushroom is starting to mature. And, um, and it basically the spores are going to, what's going to end up happening is that whole thing is going to dry out and get so dry and the spores are going to be developed on the inside. And once that um, gets so dry, it will burst open and then the spores will be released into the atmosphere and it will scatter. Um, we want to eat those way before any of that happens. So whenever that begins to happen, the middle part of that puff ball is going to start turning kind of a, a, a buff color and then a tan color and then a real brown color and then it's just gonna be hollow and yucky. So by the time it turns any kind of brownish color at all, um, it's gonna start tasting bitter and you wouldn't wanna eat it. Uh, you always wanna eat these mushrooms fresh. If, if they're not, and as with chicken of the woods and any of them, if they're not fresh, they're not gonna be very good. They might not make you sick or anything, but they're not gonna be good either. Um, and we do want to be careful with puffballs because the egg stage that I refer to as those Ammonita poisonous mushrooms, those sort of resemble puffballs when they're small. Um, they stay real close and hug the, the soil surface more. Uh, so they're not up way above the surface, they're kind of tucked in, but people see them and say, oh, look, it's puffballs, let's, let's eat these. If you cut in the middle of that though, you'll see literally like a little baby ammonite mushroom, kind of like an egg and, and you found the, the baby inside. So if you see anything like that, that is a poisonous mushroom and, and it's not gonna be good to eat. And then that pig skin puffball was the one I was referring to that is found in gardens and things. And that is not an edible puffball and actually isn't even a relation. It's just round, so people call it puffball. Um, uh, and then shaggy mane is another kind of fall mushroom. And uh, these are found kind of in grassy areas, open grassy areas. And you have to catch these quick because they're in a group of mushrooms that turn like this inky black color. And if you harvest these, you wanna harvest them when they look like this. If they've started to turn kind of inky black, and I think I have a photo, yeah. So that's what it turns into. And in just a matter of a few days, usually what we end up seeing more is just the white stalks sticking up out of the ground because the cap is already just disintegrated. And if you do end up collecting it when it looks nice and young and fresh, you got to eat that like that day because it will turn inky black in your refrigerator overnight if you don't eat it right away. Um, but yeah, they're, they're again, one of those is occasional in the spring, but mainly a fall mushroom. And it is always important to kind of point out that other white mushrooms that grow in yards are, there are some poisonous ones out there. And I'll talk about one in particular in just a bit, but um, to always be aware that you're, you're gonna uh, double check identification. And the black spore print is nice. I mean, you can actually see underneath the cap, uh, the, the spore color of being black is gonna have kind of a black tinge underneath it. And then bearded tooth is another one that comes out in the fall and these grow up on tree trunks and it grows up real high in the air a lot of times. So I'm gonna kind of speed up because we're getting a little late. Uh, we do have a few different species of bearded tooth. So this is the one that actually branches on the spine and, and this is a spine type pore surface. So um, the spores are coming out of those spines, but both are edible. And just like the puff balls, you want to cut down the middle to see that they're white in the middle. Again, they turn kind of a color that's brown eventually, and it, it makes it taste bitter. Always want to be very aware of poisonous mushrooms. Um, Ammonitas are a clear one to stay away from. So if you see mushrooms that are like a cap and stem with a ring around it and that bulbous base, it doesn't mean it's absolutely an ammonita mushroom. It could be, there are other mushrooms that have those characteristics, but um, Am and I just have those characteristics too. So you gotta be really careful about that. And, and of course, stay um, aware of that button stage of ammonitis as well. We always try to just tell people, just stay away from little brown mushrooms. There's little brown mushrooms that are edible, but there's little brown mushrooms that are terribly dangerous to eat. And the only um, truly lethal mushroom we have in the state that could actually uh, cause death is the deadly gallerina. And it's just a little, you know, it, it doesn't look like it would be dangerous. I mean, it's just like, oh, and this is on any old regular little brown mushroom. And it, it can actually kill somebody if they ing ingest it. Um, another one is Big Laughing Jim that's also a little brown mushroom. So uh, I always get some comments. I ate this other mushroom and it's little and brown, but I, for, um, to be on the cautious side, 
and to make sure that nobody accidentally eats a lethal mushroom. We wanna make sure that we just stay away from little brown mushrooms. Um, and then the green spored lepiota, and this is the one that is most commonly poisoned, um, uh, the most common poison, poisonous mushroom that's eaten in Missouri. And it, well, and throughout probably the country or the Midwest, um, it is a uh, very, very common. It grows in grass and it's white. So that's kind of why I mentioned with that shaggy mane, you always gotta be cautious of a white mushroom that's growing in the lawn because it could be this one. Um, and it looks a lot like the portobello mushrooms that you can buy at the grocery store. So people just say, oh, that's, I'll just put that on my salad instead of going to the grocery store to buy mushrooms. And it's, um, they'll have their stomach pump. It's horrible. It's never killed anybody, but it's made people um, perhaps wish that they were dead for a little while and then they got better. But uh, so it has this um, uh, green color to the spores, hence the name. And if you look underneath, it has, and these get huge, you know, um, probably like a, it can get up to six inches wide, at least probably the cap. And they grow in those kind of fairy rings, which is actually the edge of that mycelium, which is kind of cool. The, the fruiting bodies are growing at the edge of the mycelium, which makes that ring. Um, and so then, yeah, as the mushroom ages, you can actually see that, that green color on the underside. You can kind of see that in that photo. A few everyday uh, mushrooms, um, turkey tail and false turkey tail. We see those all the time. Turkey tail, and these grow on wood. Um, turkey tail, the true one, has pores on the underside. The false turkey tail, it also has pores, but it's microscopic, teeny tiny pores. So that looks smooth, like it doesn't have pores. Um, thin maize flat polypores. So those are like a different shape of pore. They're not round. They're, um, they kind of look like a maze, like, you know, the game you would play in a maze. Uh, but, you, but you have to be really careful because the picture on the right in our Missouri Mushrooms book is identified as turkey tail, um, but that is actually thin maize polypore. I had somebody call in and correct us on that after, of course, all the books were printed and sold and everything, but uh, the pores on that are not round. They're kind of elongated, and as that mushroom would grow further, they would further elongate. Um, but she was right. That's not that's not a turkey tail. That is thin maize polypore because of the shape of those pores. Artist conch is always a fun one because you can kind of it's a, a what we call perennial mushroom. So it, it will stay on there for years on this wood. And you can actually even it sort of has tree rings like like a tree um, for its growth cycle when it was actively producing spores. So it has that two um, pore surface. And you can see how in that lower right photo, the layers of each time that mushroom has grown bigger to produce more spores and it grows an extra layer of those, um, those tubes. So you can actually count like how many times, it's not necessarily the year like trees are nice because you can see that, but uh, it's, it's the times that it's actually become uh, active and, and releasing spores. Uh, the cinnabar polypore are teeny, teeny little things that you see on the um, on dead wood, on sticks and stuff. And then violet tooth polypore are very interesting because they can actually be a pore, pore surface where it's got little pores or spines. And that's where it gets that um, species name, um, Tricaptum biforme. It means two forms, so it can either be pores or spines. And then a uh, split gill mushroom is very common. It kind of looks like that popcorn packing material, um, gets kind of fuzzy on top and the gills are actually split down the middle, which is why we call that split gill. And some final just tips for eating wild mushrooms. And this is a big disclaimer that I just wanna make sure everybody is aware of. Um, check and double check the identification of your mushroom. Uh, sometimes when you get really excited about eating a mushroom, you kind of think, oh, it's okay. It says it grows on wood and this was in grep, but well, it's fine. I'm sure that it's so easy to do. So don't do that because <laughs> um, you could easily accidentally poison yourself. Uh, never eat a raw mushroom. That's tricky because people get used to eating raw mushrooms out of the grocery store and things, but those were grown in a sterile environment. Wild mushrooms are not in a sterile environment. So we don't want to do that. 
whenever you do try a new mushroom, no matter if it's edible, I mean, well, of course, I'm hoping everything you try is going to be edible. But uh, even if it's, you know, widely known like morel mushrooms, some people have allergic reactions to morel mushrooms. So you can have an allergic reaction to an edible mushroom. So we want to make sure that if it's a new mushroom, you've never had it before, try a small amount first, wait 24 hours and see, make sure you're not going to have any kind of reaction. Uh, if you have a reaction after eating a small amount, it's not going to be so bad as having a reaction after eating a lot. So do that. Um, and then only eat the fresh mushrooms. If it's slimy or gooey or stinky, too bad. It's, it's don't, don't risk it, please. Um, it's not going to taste very good anyway. Uh, and then be sure to inspect every mushroom. Some mushrooms do get kind of easy to, you know, you get picking along and, and you know, morels are like that, chanterelles are like that, and, and you accidentally pick something that wasn't what you thought it was. It's easy to do. And then if you're ever in doubt about the identification of the mushroom, just don't, I please don't risk it. <laughs> I don't, I don't want anybody to get sick or anything. So if, if you're not absolutely sure, just, just let the turtles have it or something. So there's other things that can eat it. And then also finally, be sure to check your local regulations for the conservation department. You can collect edible mushrooms for your own personal uh, consumption. You can't collect them to sell. Uh, DNR has some regulations, but they're not too strenuous. You know, you can collect some for your own. I think there is an, an amount there. Um, conservation is just whatever you can eat. Um, but then, of course, nature centers for conservation, they don't allow mushroom collecting. So there are some exceptions there, too. Um, uh, so just be sure to check wherever you're planning to go what the regulations would be for collecting mushrooms. A uh, quick little plug-in for the Missouri Mycological Society. Uh, Carol mentioned that I do serve on that as an executive secretary, and then we do have a mid-Missouri chapter, but there's chapters throughout the state. I think we might be sending out this uh, link for everybody, but uh, momyco.org is the, the um, web address, and please uh, feel free. It's a wonderful way to learn more about mushrooms. And those are two publications. The one on the left is for sale. You can pick those up at a lot of nature centers and the one on the right is a brochure that's free. So um, you can always um, get that at, at nature centers or um, events and, and you can always just ask and call in and ask. I'm sure we can get one of those to you somehow. I went way over, I am sorry for that. It is actually 10 minutes until five. So, um, but we do have some time for questions uh, if we want to, if we have time for that and if there are any questions, but thank you very much. That is all I have to present to you today other than answering questions. Thank you very much, Melissa. That was wonderful. Lots of great information. And we do have a number of questions. I'm, I'm going to go in the order of how they were presented. So, um, but, but before I do that, there was a question um, from on some of your very last slides that I want to ask while it's fresh in everybody's mind. You talked about the edible mushrooms, and then you had some slides that were titled Everyday Common Mushrooms. Are those edible too or not? Generally not. Um, the, the turkey tail is medicinal. Um, some people make tinctures out of that. I, I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, some some of them are somewhat medicinal, but but they're not they're not edible. They they wouldn't uh, taste good. <laughs> they might not make you sick, but if you tried to eat, I can't think of any of them that I I showed that that were like edible. Okay, um, just common stuff. Yeah. <laughs> just okay. Very good. Yeah, those are and that was great. Those are things. Those common everyday ones are ones that we would see, you know, maybe around our our house, our homes, and and so forth. But the the edible ones were the slides before that. Right. Yes. yes. Or yes. Before I should have clarified that. Yeah. Well, before the poisonous ones, you had edible <laughs> ones and poisonous ones, I think. And then you had the common every day, I believe, was the order. Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. And also, um, because a couple of people have asked this question, we will send a link to all of you who registered um, to a recording of this presentation so you can watch it again. And we will also share some of the resources that Melissa pointed out. And now I'm going to start in on some of the other questions we've received. Here's the first question. Since the mushroom is grown from a, from, since the, the fruiting body is, you know, develops from the mycelium, does it mean that that fruiting body will develop in the same exact location in some species or in all species, or is it never in the same location? Well, it can, you know, and that's what people say with like morel hunting. 
uh, you know, can I just go back to that area and find more else? And, and a lot of times people do, um, but then conditions change in that place. So, you know, as far as that exact location, um, probably not likely, you know, cause it's not like plants where you have like a, a bud, you know, on, on a tree and there's always something that's gonna be produced in that spot. Um, it's just more scattered out and it just kind of comes up wherever uh, it does that year. But the mycelium is in that general area, so they're going to be there. Um, but we see that with, with logs and things, you know, like, um, like the chicken of the woods that grows on those logs. There's going to be chicken of the woods on that log, but it might not be in that exact spot on that log that year, you know, but it'll be somewhere else in that log because the mycelium is just all kind of scattered in that log. Um, yeah, and then it does depend on environmental conditions. So if it's a dry year and things just didn't line up, it, it might not come up that year. Very good, thank you. Um, Elaine says, I was always told when picking morels to shake them to leave spores. Is that not something you really need to do? Well, I think theoretically it makes sense, you know, and then uh, everybody that, that harvests mushrooms, edibles, uh, they harvest in a basket. Uh, because it does kind of now, other people say like a net, a, a net a mesh bag or something that has, you know, space for the spores to, to be released, which is fine too. But a bag kind of, they get kind of stacked on top of each other and gets kind of heavy and, and they're crowded in a basket. They can just kind of lay open more and things. So, but that's part of it is part of it is just kind of keeping the airflow to the mushrooms. But um, no, it's, it's, that makes sense, you know, that you want to kind of just why not? <laughs> you don't have much to lose, but but yeah, it, it, those caps are releasing spores. So if you just kind of let them do their thing in the woods, it, it wouldn't hurt any. Uh, might not mean that you're going to have a big harvest because you did that, but. Right, very good. Um, there's a question about the, the flower on your slide. I believe that's a grass pink orchid. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, I probably that doesn't make a whole lot of sense with a talk about mushrooms, but it is, you know, uh, one relying on uh, mycorrhizal fungi and it's a plant. So there you go. <laughs> yes. Very good. Very good. Um, question. Um, you talked about relationships of uh, the mycorrhizal fungi with native plants. Would that, um, would those relationships exist with non-native plants that we might be gardening with as well? Yeah, that's a good question, and I am sure it does. I, I don't know specific examples to share with you, but yeah, I mean, that's plants in general, um, you know, benefit from that. So it's not just a North America, you know, uh, situation there. So I would not be surprised if it did, although I don't have specific examples to really point to. All right, thank you. Um, does your presentation, or that is the information you presented, apply on the other side of the state line in Kansas? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. We get a little focused on Missouri, I guess. Here. Yeah, yeah but that's a good point. Yes. yes, Melissa's with the Missouri Department of Conservation, but of course, our Grow Native program does serve the lower Midwest, which includes part of Kansas. So that's a great question. But I'm sure there could be some species that occur in Kansas that we we don't have here, but maybe more in the western part. But I, I'm I'm assuming we probably share quite a number of species, you know, in, mm -hmm. in eastern. Oh yeah, Kansas. yeah. And that's the thing with mushrooms too, is that you know with plants we've got really defined distribution maps of where they've been identified and where they we have the recordings from. But with mushrooms, it's not nearly that simple because. Um, the spores, you know, they float on the breeze. I mean, they fly on jet streams and in, in some examples that I've heard about. So, so, you know, if we can just get it down to the continent sometimes. So a lot of times, you know, they, it's, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration because we do have some that's like, well, it's found in the Midwest, you know, it's found only in the Pacific Northwest or something. Um, so uh, it, it's not nearly as defined as plants are, but no. Every, yeah, I, I do. I probably focus uh, um, my uh, examples and all a little too much on Missouri sometimes. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, question, um, Robin asks, I assumed fungi were beneficial. And I think Robin means to other plants or to the environment. Which ones are not? Or are there any that are not beneficial? Yeah, it's so funny to, to think about because the... 
like that one I showed of the honey mushroom, you know, that, those attack the tree. Um, now, usually they're more, they're stressed about something else too. You know, like maybe it's a drought stress or something. And then that fungus is getting an advantage over that tree because of that too. But they're killing that plant, but they're breaking it down to make um, available nutrients for other plants. You know, so it, it's kind of, it's not a, a simple um, situation there at all. It can be kind of complicated as, is this a benefit or a detriment if the tree didn't get it, but, but the other plants will. So, um, you know, and not all fungus is uh, beneficial at all. You know, we've, we've got uh, fungus that cause diseases and things that come in and diseases that we haven't even, um, you know, had to deal with, um, even, you know, with animals too. So, so yeah, no, they're not all beneficial at all. Mm -mm. Thank you. And I guess it'd be fair to say that, I mean, they're, they're all playing a role in nature and of de decomposer, for example, but they might also do some other things that could be detrimental to, say, a given specimen of a plant or for human health or. or oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, yep. Great. And there was a question about um, the honey mushrooms. Uh, uh, Anne says, I've heard that honey mushrooms growing on a tree honey mushrooms grow on a tree that's dying is that true if so is the mushroom contributing to its death sounds like maybe not but it's it's the tree maybe is weakened so that the honey mushroom is able to grow there or could you comment on that yeah normally we see those on dying trees and it's it is contributing you know it's kind of put, putting the nail in the coffin so to speak for that tree so you know, it could have, um, but how that mushroom got the upper hand on the tree is, uh, you know, depending on circumstances. So it could have gotten hit by lightning and, you know, it could have gotten attacked by some other parasite or something and, and had a disease. And then that fungus is now attacking that tree too. So, uh, and that's, that is what happens a lot with honey mushrooms. And we see uh, that photo I showed of just a whole bunch of them, you know, we see that quite a bit where they're just, all throughout that tree. I mean, it's, you know, that tree is, is um, going down quick. <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> and figuratively, but yeah. Connie has a question. What do we know about the effect of herbicides on mycorrhiza? And of course, herbicides are chemicals that are designed to kill plants. Mycorrhiza are a, so, sort of associations between fungi and plants. So, um, yeah. What what do we know about about the effect of herbicides or, well, or, fungi yeah. or fungicides for that matter? And it is such a complicated question too. Um, so you know, there's all kinds of indirect impacts with using with with anything we do. But you know, it's kind of like um, uh, we treat ponds for for like pond weed for water primrose, and and we kill the primrose. And the herbicide might not have had any impact on the fish because it was labeled to do that. But the decaying primrose is now killing the fish. You know, so so it it has impacts there too. Is when you're killing things like that, even though it doesn't, um, you know, absorb into the mycorrhizal like it does with the plants, but it changes that. Uh, community, it changes that environment for the herbicide or for the fungus too. So, um, you know, having a detrimental impact on that, it doesn't uh, directly kill the fungus, but um, it, it can have a negative impact on that, that fungal community indirectly. Thank you. And what about fungicides as well? Fungicides might be used, for example, on certain, on turf or in some, uh, food, you know, food crops. Uh, do, do you know anything about the, those effects? I mean, they are designed to kill fungi. So uh, maybe there, is there selective fungicides? Do you know? Oops, somehow I think we, we uh, lost Melissa. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, hopefully she can join us because I think she could answer a few more questions, but um, I see there is a question from Julie, are honey mushrooms growing in my mom's yard, seemingly killing the maple trees? Is there a way to get rid of them or plant a tree in its place that is more resilient to that species of mushroom? Um, hopefully we can get Melissa back on to answer that. Um, it, it is, 
what I understood from Melissa is it might be that the, the tree is dying anyway, and um, that uh, it might, if it, if it is looking like it's um, suffering, uh, you might want to plant a new tree. Let's see here, other questions. Um, I hope she can come back on, but if not, um, thanks everyone. Oh, it looks like she might be, there she is. Um, here she is again. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, we did have a question I, and I try, I answered it, but I don't know if I answered it correctly. Julie says, there are honey mushrooms growing in my mom's yard, seemingly killing the maple trees. Is there a way to get rid of them or plant a tree in its place that is more resilient to that species of mushroom? And what I gathered is that maybe it's dying anyway, and it might not be the mushroom or? Yeah, I well, yeah, there's probably other problems. But yeah, if you're seeing a bunch of honey mushrooms on them, that's not a good, that's probably not a good sign. Yeah, that particular species of mushroom. Um, I think talking to a forester or, you know, um, depending on where she's at, you know, we could, we have uh, community conservationists and private land conservationists and, and maybe getting a forester to look and, and see, uh, you know, who's a little more experienced than that because I'm not, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a fungicide <laughs> question and that fungicide would directly kill the fungus. So that would be even more detrimental uh, than using herbicide. All right. Um, there was a question about resources for identification, and you did share those, Melissa, so we can put those um, into the email that goes out tomorrow. Um, I Oh, one other question. How often does chicken of the woods, he says, bloom, maybe have fruiting bodies? I saw a large patch last spring near my house. Would it be, you know, having those uh, fruiting bodies again this fall? Oops, I think we lost her again. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure that she can come back. Maybe she has a weak uh, connection, but I'm just I'm gonna go ahead and, and end um, for, for today and do look for uh, the email tomorrow from us with a uh, recording of the webinar. And also uh, we have many other interesting online programming for you coming up. We have a panel discussion with artists about prairie. We have a soil microbial community webinar. Um, lots more coming up. We also have a number of plant sales coming up in September. One this Saturday at um, World Bird Sanctuary in St. Louis area. We have uh, one in Kansas City in, on September 18th and one in Springfield on October 2nd. Also another one in the St. Louis area on September 30th and you can find information about that on our website, but Melissa is back. Um, so there's For just- For the moment. <laughs> I, I don't know what's happening, but I'm so sorry. It keeps cutting okay. me off. We'll try this one last question and then we'll we'll sign off. Um, how often does chicken of the woods bloom, or I guess we'd say, you know, have fruiting bodies? I saw a large patch last spring near my house. Would it be producing fruiting bodies again this fall? Yeah, I would keep an eye on it for sure. You know, I wouldn't think twice in the same season, you know, so once it's done in the fall, it's probably going to be done, done, but for the year, but if it produced last spring, I, yeah, for sure. If, if we got the right rain at the right time and. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Well, thanks so much, Melissa. I think that's all the questions and uh, many thanks to everybody joining us. And as I said, watch for your email. Um, for uh, a, a link to the recording, um, and it'll be on our YouTube channel as well. And um, also um, in the email, we'll have some other resources for you. And do, do look up our other online programming coming up and watch for those native plant sales and um, other events we have for you this fall. Thank you so much, Melissa. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure to speak with you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.